This is the Harrier jump jet. After the Spitfire, it's probably the Harrier that's the most iconic British fighter design. It was one of the few aircraft sold to the US in numbers. And even Arnold Schwarzenegger was using the Harrier in the movie True Lies. You're fired. Britain had invented and owned vertical takeoff and landing. So why was it retired? And why do we not have a new Harrier? The answer? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> to understand the significance of the Harrier jump jet in the British psyche, you need to go back to 1982. Harriers became infamous during the Falklands War. It was the first time the V-Stall, or vertical short takeoff and landing aircraft, had seen action. A total of 28 Sea Harriers and 14 Harrier GR3s were deployed. The Sea Harrier squadrons shot down 21 Argentine aircraft with no air-to-air -air losses. I can remember seeing my hand go forwards and then back again and found myself flying at about 10 feet. I mean, that was, that's just ridiculously low. Um, but it just seemed safer down there somehow. The Sea Harrier was dubbed La Muerta Negra by Argentine pilots, meaning the Black Death. I'm not allowed to say how many planes joined the raid, but I counted them all out and I counted them all back. Their pilots were unhurt, cheerful and jubilant, giving thumbs up signs. The uh, cameraman said, get, you get back in the cockpit and give us the thumbs up. So I said, well, all right then, and sat in the cockpit, and sort of went like that, which is one of, the, one of the first images that came back. The Harrier returned from the Falklands as an icon, cementing the reputation of British aircraft design. Second generation Harrier twos went on to see action in Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. It was a fighter that was proven in combat, and if it needed to, it could even land on a shipping container. It could land vertically, take off vertically, take off on a short runway with, with a high weapon load. It was small, agile, and had tremendous acceleration, and that is performance. So, all that combined gave you a really, really useful operational flexible capability. Clearly, it was a project that should be extended or built on. So what would the next British fighter be? As it turned out, there wasn't going to be one. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, a number of aircraft companies separately decided to investigate the viability of vertical or short takeoff and landing. The concrete runways that jet aircraft required were vulnerable to attack, and the solution was to make an aircraft that could take off virtually anywhere, like they could in the Second World War. In any war, what would get hit first by the enemy? Answer, the air bases so they'd take them out. So the Harriers could operate still without a main airbase. V-Stall aircraft would be able to take off, land and refuel anywhere. Jets would be able to hide in wood blocks, improvised bases or even car parks without requiring large and vulnerable air bases. For the Cold War, that advantage could be huge if only they could get it to work. Making a jet hover turned out to be no easy task. Jets fly because of the air passing over their wings, and with no forward momentum, that doesn't work. The solution is downward thrust, enough thrust to lift the entire aircraft, with nozzles to keep it stable, and some way of then transitioning into normal flight. That's what would make a V-stall aircraft successful. But engineers around the world were going about it in different ways. As early as 1951, there were crazy designs that had aircraft taking off vertically, like rockets from warships. 
In the 60s, the US was making failed V-Stall prototypes a bit of a bad habit. There were swivelling engines on wingtips, lift fans, separate lift jet engines. The ideas were modern and brave, and of course, few of them worked. There was even a moment in history when companies were trying to make large cargo aircraft that could take off on short runways and land vertically. Even NASA had a vehicle taking off vertically. The Lunar Landing Research Vehicle was built to simulate the moon landings. And although it helped to put Neil Armstrong on the moon, even it didn't go without an accident. Of the dozens of designs from the 50s to the 80s, only the Harrier and the Yak-38 Forger reached operational status. That last one, you might not have heard of. The Yakovlev Yak-38 was a Soviet Navy V-Stall aircraft, intended for use aboard their light carriers, and 231 were built. It was used on the Soviet Union's Kiev-class carriers and was even tested in Afghanistan against the Mujahideen. Its approach was different to the Harrier. It had two dedicated lift jets located behind the pilot, making its silhouette somewhat reminiscent of today's F-35B. I'll come back to that. While other countries were attempting to design their own unique V-Stall aircraft, Britain was quietly proceeding with its own developments. First in 1953, with experimental machines like the Rolls-Royce Thrust Measuring Rig, known as the Flying Bedstead. It became the first jet lift aircraft to fly anywhere in the world. And it led to the short SC-1, designed to study vertical takeoff and landing, and the transition to forward flight. It was equipped with the first fly-by-wire control system for a V-Stall aircraft, and for years its test provided data that led to the famous Pegasus engine. And that engine is what would go on to power the Harrier. It's this vectored thrust engine that allows the pilot to change the angle at which thrust is being projected, allowing a fighter to take off vertically, hover, and land vertically for the first time ever. The Pegasus uses jets of cold air from rotatable nozzles, along with a hot jet which was directed through a conventional central tailpipe. The Pegasus engine was the first stovall engine um, in the world. And what it did is it enabled that transition from forward flight to vertical flight. Um, the actual engine itself has um, four exhausts, so two exhausts on either side, and these exhausts will rotate. So if it's facing um, backwards, it will move forward. And when it's rotating downwards, it will um, lift. Impressively, the concept for this was created in 1960, and this aircraft is still flying around today. So they've developed a product which is very innovative, but also able to adapt to new technologies. But prioritising the ability to hover meant that the Harrier had to sacrifice in other areas. It couldn't fly at supersonic speeds, and it couldn't carry as much fuel or munitions as other fighters. You can't go supersonic because the shockwave off the intake uh, puts a big ram effect. You can't go any faster. And it didn't need to because you could move the aeroplane up to the front line in these hides and get to the targets in no time. You didn't need to go supersonic. And if you use supersonics, you use a lot of fuel. But a supersonic V-Stall aircraft was being developed, just not in the UK. In the 80s, the Soviet Union wanted to upgrade its V-Stall jets. The result was the Yak-141, capable of flying at Mach 1.7. It's similar to today's F-35B due to its rotating rear nozzle technology but it never went into production. That's because its manufacturer, Yakovlev, ran out of funds due to the Soviet collapse. And it had to look elsewhere for investment. Yakovlev entered discussions with several foreign partners, but it was Lockheed who they reached an agreement with. The same Lockheed who were about to start developing the F-35. Yakovlev announced a deal with Lockheed for funds of around $400 million. In return, they'd produced three new prototypes and an additional static test aircraft. 
it was a technology transfer. This next phase of development in vertical jet aircraft brings us to the modern era. So why don't we have a new Harrier today? Well, in 1993, the US began developing its Joint Strike Fighter program. It was looking for a new aircraft, a fighter that could replace a wide range of existing aircraft. The F-16, A-10, F-18 Hornet and Aviate B Harrier. Two years later, the UK became a formal partner, signing up to buy the same aircraft. For the UK, it would replace the Harrier and Tornado. As it was replacing so much, this new aircraft had to do a lot. It would need to fly at supersonic speeds, with stealth, and be capable of short takeoff and vertical landings. A scaled up Pegasus engine couldn't reach supersonic speeds, and its nozzles sticking out of the aircraft were never going to meet the stealth requirement. So this aeroplane died a natural death because its capability could not be grown into high survivability, and that high survivability means you need a stealthy aeroplane. You can't do that with this aeroplane. For one thing, the engine configuration doesn't allow you to put the engine in the back of the aeroplane, which allows room up front for a bomb bay. So you have to have an aircraft with an engine at the back of the aeroplane. If you then want to land vertically, right, which is what the Marines wanted to do, you've got to then balance the thrust on the aeroplane by having thrust forward. On Harrier, it's produced by the forward nozzles. So how do you get thrust forward in the aeroplane? The Harrier concept didn't fit the bill. And to put the nail in the coffin, it seemed like Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works had already found and patented the perfect solution years earlier. Lockheed's patented solution? A lift fan inside the fuselage, just behind the pilot. Where the two lift jets were on the Yak-141? The answer the S-35 came up with was, put a shaft on the engine, put it at the back, put a shaft on the engine, drive the shaft through the fuselage, and drive a lift fan at the front, which provides the front post. And that was the design that teams of engineers worked on for nearly 10 years to come up with. Now, that was a bit of brilliant engineering design that was an innovation that you rarely come across. It was like Harrier in its early days. And, we, and he patented it. And we spotted the patent. And of course, when we saw it, you know, Eureka, it had to be the best solution. And so that won the competition. And of course, we in the UK said, OK, we'll join that programme because the RAF want the aeroplane. Where the Harrier has its rotating engine nozzles for downward thrust, the F-35 uses a combination of its internal lift fan and by rotating its main engine nozzle at the back so that it's pointing down. Together, the fan and nozzle produce more than 40,000 pounds of thrust, enough to lift the nearly 20-tonne aircraft. The lift system is designed very differently from the Pegasus in that um, its main module is the lift fan, which is to the front of the aircraft. It has a counter-rotating fan, and it essentially pushes the airflow downwards. And then you've got the, um, the drive shaft and the clutch and the roll posts, and the roll posts either side to help balance um, the um, aircraft. And then you've got the three-bearing swivel module at the back, which is totally unique in its design. Um, it also directs airflow downwards, but it can um, rotate around 95 degrees within around two and a half um, seconds. The entire capability of the lift system is around 40,000 pounds of thrust. Um, and to put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of launching 10 elephants to the top of the Empire State Building um, in seven seconds. Well, wow. it also performs. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. The lift fan devised by Lockheed and DARPA in the early 80s was the only workable solution that could give a plane vertical capability, supersonic speed and radar evading stealth. Obviously, Lockheed came out the winners in the procurement process. And just like that, Britain's next hovering fighter jet was going to be the F-35B. We talk about Stovall a lot, short takeoffs, hovering, vertical landings, 
slow landings, but they're just the smallest part of what we do with an F-35. And what was very difficult to do in the Harrier era is remarkably simple for an F-35 pilot to accomplish. We do not need to be spending our time worrying about landing and taking off an F-35. We need to dedicate our time to employing what the aircraft is capable of doing. And so we've made the Stovall functions so simple that every man and woman finds it remarkably easy to transition to. Look, in an F-35 in the hover, you could take your hands off because it's completely stable on its own. It is remarkably simple to get into that, that position and to put on the ground on purpose. It, it may sound simple, but it took us years, us, a big team, years to decide how the controls should be harmonized, how we could make an aircraft fly in that Stovall regime, but then transition to the conventional flying aircraft that we needed it to be. That's a, a product of the Vauk Harrier uh, research work. That's a product of the X-35 team. And that's a lot of understanding over the years of what the human, we expected the human to do. Yeah, the sitting in a hover is essentially hands-off task, where in the Harrier, it was a non-stop effort to keep it stable there. In some ways, modern hovering jets have more in common with a Soviet aircraft than the Harrier. But for UK manufacturing, the F-35 project isn't doom and gloom. BAE and Rolls-Royce are building parts all over the airframe. Success for Lockheed and the F-35 means financial success for British engineering, but not necessarily success for British aircraft design. If you do what you did before in a typhoon, a tornado, a Harrier into the F-35, then you are wasting the potential of what this aircraft's all about. So I do think for all the Air Forces, they realized there's not much of what I did before that transitions to this new world. Wow, that's a big, big step forward. So I think we've tried not to repeat from the older generation and that we've tried to buy into this is something completely new. Not since the Harrier has the UK designed an entire military fighter jet. Those days of being at the forefront of aircraft design seem to have ended with the Harrier. But fighter jets that can hover? They didn't. Give this video a like for the puppet alone. That is not easy. <laughs>